In the tranquil southern town of Biloxi, Mississippi, in the year 1987, a veneer of peace masked a seething underbelly of corruption. This simmering secret would soon explode into the open, shattering the lives of two influential citizens and exposing a vast conspiracy that had taken root on Mississippi's Gulf Coast. On an ordinary summer night, Monday, September 14, 1987, the town lay under the warmth of the evening, with most of its residents seeking refuge within the comforts of their homes. Among them were State Circuit Court Judge Vincent Sherry and his wife, Margaret. After a long day's work, they were relishing the quietude, basking in the serenity of their life. Judge Vincent Sherry was a respected figure in Biloxi, and Margaret had her sights set on a mayoral run, actively involved in social and community events. Their life was a picture of contentment, having successfully raised three children, and they were eagerly anticipating a visit to their out-of-state daughter in the coming days. It was just as they settled in for the night that an unexpected visitor arrived at their doorstep, unknowingly heralding a tragedy that would reveal the dark underbelly of Biloxi's corruption. Their idyllic world came crashing down when the Sherrys failed to fulfill their scheduled plans with their daughter. It wasn't until two days later, on Wednesday, September 16th, that the first alarm bells rang. Colleagues of Judge Vincent Sherry noticed his conspicuous absence from the courtroom. Worried calls to the Sherry residence went unanswered, deepening the sense of concern. One of Vincent Sherry's close friends and former law partner, Peter Hallett, received a call from the court. Good morning, Peter, his colleague spoke anxiously, but he hadn't seen or heard from the judge either. He's supposed to be in court, and I don't know where he is. Fearing the worst, Peter Hallett decided to call the Sherry's home. He left a concerned message on their answering machine, desperately hoping for a response. However, his anxiety drove him to check on his friend personally. I've got to go over there, he declared, asking his junior partner, Charles Legere, to accompany him. I need some help. Let's go. I'll give you a call back. Legere concurred, understanding the gravity of the situation. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a good idea for us to go together, he responded. As they approached the Sherry's residence, Legere attempted to engage Hallett in conversation, perhaps to alleviate the growing unease. They noticed both of the Sherry's cars parked in the driveway, a sight that only deepened their concern. With a heavy heart, Halat asked Legere to approach the house while he inquired with a neighbor if she had seen the couple. Halat rang the doorbell repeatedly, but the eerie silence that followed sent shivers down his spine. Peter Hallett noticed something amiss as he approached the Sherry's residence. The last two morning newspapers lay untouched on their doorstep. Alarmed by this sign of neglect, he spoke to the neighbor, who mentioned that she hadn't seen the Sherry's for a couple of days, which struck her as unusual since both of their cars were still parked in the driveway. Hallett's concern deepened when he attempted to open the Sherry's front door and found it unlocked. It was a clear indication that something was wrong. As he cautiously stepped inside, his heart heavy with foreboding, he made a chilling discovery. Judge Sherry had been brutally gunned down in his own home. The authorities were swiftly called, and the murder of Vincent Sherry, an esteemed figure in the community, became an urgent priority for the police. Detectives reached out to the local FBI field office, and though formal involvement was yet to be established, the FBI offered their assistance, providing both their agents and forensic laboratory resources. Inside the house, the investigators meticulously combed the crime scene for any leads. They meticulously analyzed blood spatter patterns to determine the angles at which the projectiles had struck. If they could pinpoint where the murderer had stood when firing the fatal shots, it might shed light on the sequence of events. Among the investigators, Inspector Robert Burris, a crime technician with the Biloxi Police Department, played a pivotal role in processing the scene. In the den, Burris made a critical discovery, a trail of blood leading from the victim's feet, curving between his legs and ending where he lay. There were also blood spatters on a double sliding glass door just beyond his head. Upon further examination of the room, small pieces of foam rubber were found. Burris couldn't immediately discern the source of this foam rubber, but a thorough search of the house led to one conclusion. It had been brought inside the house deliberately. 
Every piece of material within the house, from pillows to mattresses and beyond, was scrutinized for any trace of foam rubber. Not a single item within the house displayed any signs of torn or disturbed foam rubber. It became evident that the foam rubber had been intentionally brought into the house and it was found to bear gunshot residue. It was clear that this foam rubber had been used as an improvised silencer, muffling the sound of the fatal bullets when discarded. Fingerprint analysis within the house yielded no valuable leads. However, investigators discovered nine spent 22 caliber shell casings from a semi-automatic pistol, along with the bullets that had taken the lives of the Sherrys. The arrangement of the casings indicated that the shots had been fired in quick succession. Remarkably, the killer had managed to leave minimal evidence behind, a testament to the precision with which the crime had been executed. There were no indications of items stolen, signs of struggle, forced entry, or ransacking, suggesting that the assailant's sole purpose was to carry out the double homicide. Special Agent Keith Bell from the Biloxi FBI field office concurred that this was the work of a professional. The Sherrys had been assassinated, and the crime scene was exceptionally devoid of incriminating evidence, indicating meticulous planning and execution. The choice of a small-caliber weapon, coupled with the presence of foam rubber, pointed toward the use of a silencer. Notably, both victims had been shot in the head, emphasizing the professionalism of the crime. In response to this high-profile and enigmatic case, a multi-agency task force, including Special Agent Keith Bell, was assembled. These investigators dedicated days to meticulously processing the crime scene, all while grappling with a central question. Why had the Sherrys been targeted for murder? The reason behind the assassination of both Judge Vincent Sherry and Margaret Sherry remained a perplexing mystery especially since Judge Sherry's routine morning or afternoon jogs were a plausible opportunity for an attack, making the motive behind Margaret's murder all the more puzzling. The investigation took a significant turn as authorities explored the possible connection between the Sherry's murders and the ongoing controversy surrounding the future of Biloxi. Some civic leaders were envisioning a transformation of the quiet southern town on Mississippi's Gulf Coast into a glitzy resort destination with the lure of casinos to attract tourist dollars. However, the town was already home to strip clubs, which stirred concerns within the community. Margaret Sherry, in particular, saw these developments as threats to Biloxi's small-town charm and believed that the introduction of casinos would also bring a criminal element into the area. As a mayoral candidate, she had garnered powerful political enemies due to her staunch opposition to gambling. Agent Bell contemplated whether Margaret had been silenced to halt her protests. She had been an outspoken political figure, well known for her anti-gambling stance. If elected mayor in 1989, her plans included shutting down the remaining strip clubs in Biloxi, further inciting opposition. Therefore, the task force considered the possibility that Margaret, rather than Judge Sherry, might have been the intended target. The task force embarked on an inquiry into Margaret's political adversaries, but their initial focus was on questioning the Sherry's friends and neighbors. It was expected that someone within the neighborhood might have witnessed something vital to the case. However, even those who had known the Sherry's for years were reluctant to share information, haunted by the fear of Biloxi's emerging criminal underworld. The Sherry's tragic murders cast a dark shadow over the city of Biloxi. Many of its residents were apprehensive about openly expressing their opinions. They had witnessed Margaret Sherry, a prominent and vocal figure in political circles, meet a tragic end alongside her esteemed husband, Judge Sherry. The fear of repercussions from the city's evolving criminal landscape had silenced many concerned citizens. In the wake of these murders, the reluctance of witnesses to cooperate with FBI agents or local police officers was conspicuous. The fear of having their names associated with the case dissuaded many from coming forward. Faced with this wall of silence, investigators began considering an alternative approach, speaking with Lynn Posito, the daughter of the Sherrys. Upon being informed of her parents' tragic murders, Lynn hastily traveled from her North Carolina residence to Biloxi, her resolve unwavering as she sought justice. Determined to uncover any potential leads, Lynn questioned individuals throughout the neighborhood.
It was a family friend who provided a pivotal piece of information, describing a suspicious car and its driver in the vicinity on the night of the murders. Lynn promptly relayed this crucial lead to the local police. With her assistance, authorities managed to locate a man who had observed a suspicious Ford Fairmont near the Sherry residence on the fateful night of September 14, 1987. Subsequently, investigators endeavored to ascertain the identity of the driver based on the witness's description. However, their search yielded no results. Several days later, not far from the Sherry's home, investigators stumbled upon an abandoned Ford Fairmont. A check of the vehicle's identification number revealed that it had been reported stolen the day preceding the murders. Furthermore, the license plates on the car did not match its registration. Recognizing that this vehicle likely served as the getaway car for the assailant, investigators transported it to a police garage for a more thorough examination. Their hope was to uncover a key that might lead to the identity of the killer. Less than a week after the brutal murders of Vince and Margaret Sherry, investigators encountered their first promising lead in the form of this abandoned car, which matched the description given by witnesses who had seen it on the night of the murders. After notifying Agent Keith Bell of the discovery, investigators meticulously combed the car for any potential evidence. Inspector Robert Burris, responsible for processing the vehicle, noticed an unusual detail. He observed that the dome light in the car had been disassembled, with the bolt removed. This meant that when the car door was opened, there would be no interior light. Additionally, both sun visors were in the down position, whether it was daytime or nighttime, which would hinder the visibility of anyone inside the vehicle. The investigators grew increasingly convinced that they had found the car used by the Sherry's killer. Anything discovered inside was meticulously catalogued, packaged, and shipped to the FBI labs in Washington, D.C. However, to their dismay, the FBI lab examiners in Washington found nothing of evidentiary value. Agent Bell, upon his arrival, decided to take a closer look at the license tag. What he uncovered was a compelling story of its own. It was determined that the license plate affixed to the Ford Fairmont had been stolen from an abandoned vehicle in 1984, three years before the Sherry's murders. This revelation indicated that someone had removed the license plate back in 1984, retained it for years, and then used it when the major crime occurred in Biloxi. Faced with a lack of solid evidence, investigators set their sights on tracing the stolen tag, hoping it would lead them to the killer. The trail led them to an apartment complex where the original car had been abandoned three years earlier. Contacting the apartment manager, they learned that before having the vehicle towed, he had called a friend to strip it for parts. This friend was a man with a name and reputation known to the agents, Biloxi locksmith Lenny Sweatman. Sweatman belonged to a loosely organized criminal group that the FBI had been investigating in connection with another case known as the Dixie Mafia. Agent Keith Bell connected the car used in the Sherry killings to Lenny Sweatman, and this raised the question of potential ties between the Dixie Mafia and the Sherry murders. If Sweatman had played a role, Bell suspected that other Dixie Mafia members might also be involved. Bell began delving into Sweatman's associates, and this pointed to the possibility that Mike Gillick, the owner of three strip clubs in Biloxi, and a close personal friend and longtime associate of Sweatman, might have a connection to the murders. Gillick was well known to local law enforcement and had been under investigation by the FBI in relation to the Dixie Mafia. Special Agent Bell aimed to uncover a connection between the ongoing Sherry murder investigation and a clandestine operation known as the Lonely Heart Scam. This fraudulent scheme was orchestrated from Angola Prison in Louisiana, spearheaded by Kirksey Nix, the incarcerated kingpin of the Dixie Mafia. Nix's Lonely Heart Scam entailed placing ads in gay magazines, soliciting money to aid fictional gay men entangled in legal troubles. The proceeds from this scam were intended to resolve Nix's own legal predicaments as he was serving a life sentence for murder. From behind bars, Nix coordinated what was termed the homosexual scam, successfully garnering hundreds of thousands of dollars from individuals nationwide and even some in Canada. Nix's ultimate goal was to use this money to secure his release or make an attempt to do so. 
Readers who believed they were helping gay men in need would wire or mail money to a nearby Western Union. Nix would then contact his outside accomplice, Mike Gillick, who in turn dispatched a bagman to collect the funds. Gillick ensured that the ill-gotten gains were distributed among Dixie Mafia members and safely concealed for Kirksey Nix. In the subsequent months, investigators gathered more evidence pertaining to the Lonely Heart scam but remained without a direct link to the Sherry's killers. A year into the investigation, the murder case appeared to stall. As months stretched to 16, the frustration of the Sherry's daughter, Lynn Spazito, grew palpable. In January 1989, she hired a private investigator to reinvigorate the inquiry into her parents' murder, determined to propel the case forward. The family had yearned for a swift resolution, yet by early 1989, no arrests had been made and the FBI had not yet officially become involved in the case. This lack of official FBI involvement hindered Special Agent Bell's efforts. Special Agent Bell, unable to officially act, welcomed the assistance of a private investigator when the investigator paid him a visit. Their acquaintance dated back to the investigator's days in law enforcement. Given the official limitations on Agent Bell, they hoped to collaborate and share information. This private investigator would pursue a lead that appeared promising. Interviewing another inmate at Angola Prison, the private investigator and Bell aimed to establish a link between the Lonely Heart scam and the Sherry murders. The inmate they sought was Bobby Joe Fabian, another known member of the Dixie Mafia serving time for kidnapping and the shooting of a state trooper. Fabian asserted that he had no involvement in the Sherry murders. Instead, he claimed to have learned from fellow inmate Kirksey Nix that Nix had orchestrated the killing of Judge Sherry. The motive, as Fabian revealed, was that Judge Sherry had purportedly stolen money from Nix's Lonely Heart scam. Fabian's account did not stop there. He alleged that Pete Hallett, Sherry's former law partner and the man who had delivered the eulogy at the Sherry's funeral had played a key role in both the Lonely Heart scam and the murders. Halat had officially represented Nix on legal matters, but Fabian contended that Halat's involvement was far from legal. He was receiving money from Nix for safekeeping, orchestrated through Mike Gillick's bag man. The connection between the outlaw and the lawyer ran deep, with Kirksey Nix's girlfriend and accomplice, Larray Sharp, working in Halat's office. Fabian claimed that both Sharp and Halat were storing scam money in a safe deposit box for Nix, and the amount had grown to six figures. With Fabian's revelations, a significant link was established between the Sherry murders and the Lonely Heart scam. Not only did Fabian provide a possible motive for the killings, but he also disclosed the name of the alleged hitman, an ex-convict known as John Ransom. The quest to locate John Ransom, who was believed to be residing in Georgia, was going to be a time-consuming process. Whenever law enforcement discussed notorious Dixie Mafia members, John Ransom's name invariably came up. He had long been considered an alleged hitman for the Dixie Mafia. In August of 1989, two years after the Sherry murders, Special Agent Bell had accumulated enough evidence to justify a full FBI investigation into the killings. Accompanied by Lynn Spazito, the Sherry's daughter, he approached the United States Attorney and the FBI to request the official opening of the case. The tying of the scam to the murders revealed the presence of federal violations, including wire fraud, mail fraud, and the potential involvement of a hitman traveling from Georgia to Mississippi to carry out the Sherry's killings. Consequently, an official FBI investigation was launched, and it was conducted in collaboration with local authorities. However, a significant development complicated the investigation. During this time, Pete Hallett, the former law partner of Judge Sherry, had been elected as the mayor of Biloxi. With a key suspect now occupying such a high position, investigators encountered new obstacles. While it wasn't an assertion of corruption within the local police, it was a recognition that Mayor Halat had placed his own individuals in critical positions such as Director of Public Safety and Police Chief. This made the FBI cautious about sharing all of its information with the local authorities. In August 1989, as investigators delved deeper into the Sherry murders, an informant named Bobby Joe Fabian made an unexpected move. He decided to reveal his account of the Sherry murders to a TV news station. Fabian hoped that by drawing attention to himself, Kirksey Nix would be less inclined to have him targeted for cooperating with authorities. 
The TV station broadcasted Fabian's story along with a mugshot of John Ransom, the alleged hitman linked to the Sherry case. When Charles Legere, Peter Hallett's junior partner, saw Ransom's photo, it startled him. He recollected seeing Ransom outside the Sherry Hallett law offices a few weeks before the murders occurred. Charles Legere shared his account with the task force, and Major Randy Cook of the Harrison County Sheriff's Department conducted his statement. Legere recalled that he remembered John Ransom because Ransom had approached him, inquiring about the location of Sherry's office. During the interview, Legere noted an unusual aspect about Ransom's gait. Ransom had a prosthetic leg. Investigators discovered that Ransom was presently incarcerated in a Georgia prison, serving time for another murder. When questioned about the Sherry murders, Ransom refused to cooperate. As Cook probed further into Legere's recollections of the day they discovered the bodies, a crucial detail surfaced. Legere remembered that when Pete Hallett walked into the Sherry's living room, he had stated, Vince and Margaret are dead. This information was relayed to Agent Bell. The significance of this detail lay in the fact that Margaret's body was located in the farthest back bedroom of the residence. According to Chuck Legere, Pete Hallett had only briefly entered the front of the house and would not have had any way of knowing that Margaret's body was also situated in the very back bedroom. In October 1989, two years after the murders, Agent Bell believed that Pete Hallett was involved, but he still lacked sufficient evidence for an arrest. Nonetheless, he decided it was time to confront Mayor Halat with a quiet, man-to-man -man warning. Bell made it clear that he believed Halat possessed a greater knowledge of the Sherry murders than he had shared with law enforcement authorities thus far. Bell also conveyed that the FBI would continue its relentless pursuit until the case was completely solved. Hallett, a lawyer himself, likely recognized the necessity for more concrete evidence to secure a conviction. However, he may not have fully comprehended the depth of Bell's commitment to bring him to justice. Three years had elapsed since the brutal murder of Judge Vincent Sherry and his wife, Margaret, in their Biloxi, Mississippi home. FBI Special Agent Keith Bell had connected the killings to members of the Dixie Mafia and to Judge Sherry's friend and former law partner, Pete Hallett. The alleged trigger man, John Ransom, remained tight-lipped and uncooperative. In January of 1990, Agent Bell, along with Major Randy Cook of the Harrison County, drove to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary to question another possible accomplice. This individual was Special Agent Bill Rhodes, who had been a known associate of John Ransom. Rhodes, unlike Ransom, was willing to cooperate. He disclosed that in early 1987, Ransom had approached him about driving the getaway car for a crime planned to take place in southern Mississippi. Ransom had mentioned that a judge would be assassinated, and the pay offered was $10,000. Ransom had also made certain promises to Rhodes, assuring him access to Biloxi at any time. In March 1987, Rhodes journeyed to Biloxi and met with Ransom and another man named Pete. It was Pete who had specifically asked both Rhodes and Ransom to carry out the hit. Rhodes also had a meeting with Mike Gillick, the owner of Biloxi Strip Clubs, who would provide the money once the murder was accomplished. However, five months later before they could execute the job, Rhodes was arrested on an unrelated bank robbery charge. This development led Ransom to grow apprehensive, fearing that Rhodes might cooperate with authorities. While the information provided by Rhodes propelled the case forward, Agent Bell and Officer Cook still believed that John Ransom held the crucial missing pieces. Another year would pass with limited progress. Finally, in late 1990, the investigators traveled to the Bostick Correctional Institute in Georgia, where Ransom was serving time. Ransom agreed to talk, and he admitted to delivering a .22 caliber pistol to Larray Sharp, Kirksey Nix's girlfriend. However, Ransom asserted that he did not personally carry out the murders. Based on Ransom's revelations, Larray Sharp's involvement began to appear more significant than merely stashing scam money in a safe deposit box. Through her contact with Sharp, Nix's operation seemed to extend further. When Kirksey Nix learned that the investigation was intensifying, he grew concerned that his girlfriend might divulge information. To preempt this potential problem, he attempted to eliminate her by arranging a contract for her life. However, in late 1990, Special Agent Bell apprehended her for her role in the murders, inadvertently safeguarding her from Nix's hired assassin. 
During a polygraph test, Leray Sharp denied any involvement in the Lonely Heart scam and the Sherry murders, but the lie detector machine revealed the falsehood in her statements. With this crucial piece of evidence, Agent Bell and his team were ready to bring indictments against several key figures. Among those charged as conspirators in the Sherry murders were Mike Gillick, John Ransom, Leray Sharp, and Kirksey Nix. Notably absent from the list was Pete Halat. The case against Hallett would have to wait until enough evidence for a murder conviction was gathered. At the moment, the FBI aimed to secure convictions for the others on charges of conspiracy to commit murder. The prosecution in the conspiracy trial called several key witnesses, including one involved in the Lonely Heart scam. Their testimonies played a pivotal role in helping investigators unravel the intricate scheme. This effort ultimately connected the Sherry murders to the scam. All four defendants were found guilty. Kirksey Nix received an additional 15-year sentence, in addition to the life sentence he was already serving for a prior murder. Mike Gillick was handed a 15-year prison term, and John Ransom was sentenced to 10 years. Leray Sharp also faced legal consequences. With these conspirators behind bars and the Lonely Heart scam no longer operational, justice was served although the case against Pete Hallett still remained pending. Agent Bell had a clear mission after the initial convictions in 1991. The Sherry investigation wasn't closed because the actual shooters of the Sherrys hadn't been identified yet. Additionally, Pete Hallett had not been indicted or convicted at that point. It was widely believed that Pete Hallett played a significant role in the scam and the murder plot. Therefore, the determination was to continue the investigation, seeking enough evidence to indict and convict Mr. Hallett and the actual shooter. In late July 1992, Agent Bell finally received the breakthrough he had been seeking. Following the conspiracy trial, Mike Gillick was desperate to secure his release from prison. He contacted an associate in Biloxi and asked them to approach Robbie Gant with an offer. Gant promptly informed Agent Bell about this offer, the associate had proposed a bribe of $20,000 to Gant on the condition that he would recant his testimony against Gillick and sign a false affidavit, stating that he had been coerced into testifying falsely against Gillick. Gant agreed to cooperate and wore a wire to record the bribe offer from Gillick's associate during their meeting in Mississippi. This time, Gant's tape was rolling when Gillick's associate reiterated the bribe, as Bell had instructed. With this evidence in hand, Agent Bell had the leverage he needed to intensify the pressure on Gillick and enlist the help of someone who could provide an insider's perspective. By 1993, six years after the double murder of Vince and Margaret Sherry, FBI agent Keith Bell had successfully incarcerated four members of the Dixie Mafia. Nevertheless, he was still lacking formal murder convictions against those involved, and Mayor Peter Hallett, the suspected mastermind of the case, remained free and in control of the city of Biloxi. In fact, the previous year, Mayor Hallett had even initiated the construction of the city's first major casino. Although Mayor Pete Hallett celebrated the groundbreaking of Biloxi's first major casino, he continued to face relentless media scrutiny regarding his alleged involvement in the Sherry murders. Nevertheless, Hallett vehemently maintained his innocence. Agent Bell persisted in executing his plan. He utilized the recorded bribe, obtained by Robert Gant, to bring another charge against Mike Gillick. While Gillick was already incarcerated, Bell indicted him for witness bribery and witness tampering, based on his attempt to buy off Gant. This development proved to be a turning point in the case, and the most significant one occurred in October of 1993, when Mike Gillick ultimately decided to cooperate. He was ready to reveal the full story of the case from an insider's perspective, which was a crucial breakthrough allowing for the ultimate resolution of this long-running investigation. After years of dedicated effort, it was a moment of satisfaction for Agent Bell. Finally, his patience, perseverance, and ingenuity seemed to be paying off. Gillick, a career criminal, had to adapt to life on the right side of the law, which was a challenging transition. Initially, he attempted to use deception, but it became evident that telling the truth was his only option. For the first time, Bell had access to the inside story, as Gillick knew all the intricate details. 
Mike Gillick was at the center of the case, holding knowledge about Kirksey Nix and Pete Hallett, with their connections dating back for years. In fact, when Kirksey Nix needed an attorney on the Mississippi coast, it was Mike Gillick who knew just the person to recommend. Mike Gillick introduced Kirksey Nix to Pete Hallett, confirming that Hallett was the mastermind behind the plan to murder the Sherrys. This sinister plot had its roots in the Lonely Heart scam orchestrated by Angola prison inmate Kirksey Nix. Several months before the Sherry's tragic deaths, Hallett took action to secure the stolen money from the safe deposit box he and Nix's girlfriend Larry Sharp had access to. This effectively cut off Sharp's access to the funds, which he then transferred into a box only he and Judge Sherry could access. Motivated by greed, Hallett stole a significant sum of $100,000 in cash from the box. As Nix's trusted accomplice, Hallett could easily shift the blame for this theft onto Judge Sherry. Hallett subsequently approached Mike Gillick with news of the missing money, claiming that Judge Sherry was the one responsible. Hallett knew that Kirksey Nix would be greatly angered by this. The identity of the individual who ordered Margaret's death remains unknown, but as a staunch opponent of corruption, she posed a significant threat to the criminal elements seeking to exert control over Biloxi. With Margaret out of the way, Hallett could potentially seize power in the town. Gillick revealed that he and Hallett had planned the Sherry's murders. When Ransom and Rhodes, the original conspirators, backed out of committing the murders, Gillick and Hallett sought a replacement. They found Thomas Holcomb, a small-time criminal based in Texas, who was willing to carry out the murders for a payment of $20,000. Gillick also played a role in providing the car for the crime with the assistance of locksmith Lenny Sweatman. In October 1996, agents arrested Hitman Thomas Holcomb in Texas on murder charges. That same month marked the long-anticipated arrest that Agent Bell had worked diligently for over nine years to accomplish, the arrest of Pete Hallett for the murders of the Sherrys. Hallett faced the charges and maintained his innocence. In 1997, a full decade after the crimes were committed, he was tried and convicted, receiving an 18-year sentence in federal prison. Kirksey Nix and Thomas Holcomb, both of whom were also tried and convicted, received life sentences, and Larray Sharp, Nix's girlfriend, was sentenced to five years. The case's legacy serves as a warning to the criminal element, demonstrating that even a decade later, Diligent and dedicated law enforcement professionals will persistently work to bring perpetrators of major crimes to justice. While the Sherry's killers were finally held accountable, Margaret Sherry's vision of a Biloxi free from gambling was never realized. Instead, Biloxi has transformed into a resort town brimming with casinos and neon lights. The once sleepy southern town has forever changed, and Margaret's dream of preserving it is remembered alongside the tragic loss of her life. If you've enjoyed this video and want more heart-pounding content, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Stay vigilant, stay fearless, and stay tuned for more bone-chilling adventures on Survival Horror Channel. Thanks for watching, and until next time.